Welcome everyone to day two of our virtual OT conference. We are so glad that you all have joined us today and perhaps some of you joined us last night for our webinar on non-motor symptoms. Um, if not, if you missed that webinar, just know that it has been recorded and will be available in an on-demand version next week in our LSVT Global blog. Um, so the title of this webinar today is an interprofessional practice approach to improving occupational participation, communication, and mobility in Parkinson's disease. Um, and so we're really excited for the next 75 minutes to dig into this topic and to share information with you from our clinical experience and from research as well. Um, and also just a quick note for those of you that do attend the live webinars um, in full, you will have a chance to win free prizes, including an online LSVT big training and certification course. Um, and you'll get one chance to win for every live webinar that you attend. So just really excited about that. And we celebrate OTs at a time that we wish we were gathering at the AOTA annual conference and expo in Boston, but of course that's been canceled. So we are bringing this, uh, our part of the conference to you. So these are our presenters today. I'm really grateful to have um, presenting to you today, two of our OT faculty uh, in LSVT Big, Erica Vitek and Bernie Kozer, um, who are going to be presenting part of the session today. Also, Dr. Cynthia Fox, who's a speech language pathologist, but also serves as faculty for both LSVT Big and LSVT Loud. And I myself am Laura Gousset. I'm a physical therapist and one of the LSVT Big faculty as well. So you'll be hearing from all four of us throughout this webinar. Um, I have put our bios here. I'm not going to read through them for the sake of time, but they're here for your own reference. Um, please do download the handout so that you have these bios in case you need them for self-report of CEUs. Uh, but in a nutshell, all four of us have uh, years of experience providing LSVT big and LSVT loud in our own practices and um, are just really happy to share how that works as a team between speech, PT, and OT. Some brief disclosures for you. We have both financial and non-financial relationships with LSVT Global, including a treatment preference for the LSVT protocols. And also um, Dr. Fox and I are employees of LSVT Global and Dr. Fox has ownership interest in the company. Additionally, as presenters, we receive lecture honorarium from LSVT Global. The most um, time in this webinar is going to be spent presenting the content, but we will leave about 10 minutes at the end for questions. And in just a moment, I'll go through how to ask questions during this webinar. In terms of logistics right now, all of your microphones are muted. Um, there are many of you, so if we all had you unmuted, there might be a lot of background noise. At the end of the webinar, you will have the opportunity to be unmuted and ask your question out loud if you so choose. Also at the end of the webinar, there will be a survey that should pop up automatically. I really encourage you to fill that out. We read those surveys and value your feedback. The last thing in terms of logistics is this. In the control panel right now, um, you might see a little handouts tab. If you click on that arrow, that should open it up and you can see that there are several handouts in there. One is the slides from today's show. So if you wanna download those, print those, um, have those for reference, those are yours to keep. Um, also, we have information on our virtual OT conference, the discounts that are available with it, and our upcoming webinars tomorrow. And the other two um, are informational flyers for professionals and students who are wanting to know a little bit more about LSVT Big and how to get trained. If you are an OT, um, PT, or speech therapist, um, here's some information on how to report CE activity. So these are not state registered or pre-approved for um, CEUs, but you can use this webinar for self-reported CEU if your state allows that. So if you would like to use this for CEU credit, please email us after the webinar 
at webinars at lsvtglobal.com to request an electronic certificate. And that certificate will include your name, the date, and the title of the webinar, and the duration of the webinar. If you're not sure if your state accepts self-report, please do um, contact your state board to see if you can um, use this for self-reported CE. To um, report it, you do have to attend for the full hour, however. At the end of the webinar, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions. At any time during the webinar, you can type in your questions in the control panel. We will stockpile those and answer those in order at the end of the webinar. So if something comes to mind, don't hesitate to type in your question. Um, you can also raise your hand. Now, if you have your hand raised right now, we probably won't answer it just so, because we have a lot of content to get through. But at the end of the webinar, I'll review with you how you can raise your hand and ask your question out loud. If you think of a question later, you can always email us at info at lsvtglobal.com. And if we have so many questions that we run out of time, um, we'll also respond to your questions that way. Here are the learning objectives. Um, by the end of the webinar, we hope you'll be able to define interprofessional practice, describe the background for targeting amplitude and sensory recalibration across motor systems and rehabilitation disciplines in PD, describe LSVT Loud and LSVT Big and how they fit into the IPP model, highlight key research on both protocols and also discuss the practical implementation of the team approach using these protocols and utilization also of other healthcare and community-based professions. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Cynthia Fox, who's gonna kick off our content. Thank you, Laura, and welcome everyone. We're thrilled to have you with us today in our first ever virtual conference um, for occupational therapists. And there may be additional uh, professionals out there as well, as this is a, a presentation on interprofessional practice in Parkinson's disease. So what I'm going to do is just sort of set the stage for what this means, and then we'll dig into the details as we go through the presentation. So to define IPP, um, and this definition was put forth by um, the American Speech Language Hearing Association, but I think it, it's pretty consistent with other organizations' definitions. It occurs when multiple service providers from different professional backgrounds provide comprehensive healthcare or educational services by working with individuals and their families, caregivers, and communities to deliver the highest quality of care across settings. When we take that definition and we apply it to people with Parkinson's disease, we recognize that this interprofessional family is very large. Next slide. Parkinson's disease, as we all know, is complex and it takes a village to help manage it best for the person with Parkinson's disease. And certainly that person and their family are at the center of this interprofessional practice. But we see we have an extensive medical team, not just the neurologists that we tend to think of, but it may potentially involve neurosurgery, the general physicians, nurses, um, physiatrists, pharmacists, urologists, gastroenterologists, dentists, all these types of medical professionals. Our allied health team, of course, which we are keen on our speech, physical and occupational therapists, but also extending that to consider clinical neuropsychologists, social workers, nutritionists, sex therapists, audiologists. And then of course the commu community team, we know today it's exciting to see how many people with Parkinson's disease are engaged in community, exercise classes, personal trainers, massage, acupuncture, support groups, and singing groups. So it's a large group of individuals, and I think the goal is how can we all work together? When we look traditional roles of medical management versus allied health, the focus of medical has been on the disease process while we focus on the impact of that disease on daily functioning. The medical management reduces symptoms, minimizes disease severity, often through neuropharmacological or neurosurgical approaches, where our role is to decrease disability um, due to motor and non-motor symptoms, improve participation in activities and improve level of activities. 
Um, the mechanism of the medical management may be to correct or replace the nigrostriatal dysfunction, whereas we potentially provide support compensatory strategies. Scientific evidence is moderate to strong for medical management. And for speech and physical therapy, it's also moderate to uh, strong. Occupational therapy right now is limited, but I think that will change in uh, the years to come. And so our one common goal overall is to improve quality of life for people living with Parkinson's disease. When we look at how allied health has worked in the future, uh, in the future, in the past, you know, and historically, while we all know each other and we know what each other does in speech, physical and occupational therapy, um, it's been more loosely connected management. And so oftentimes allied health interventions are delivered in isolation of the other therapies, despite the fact that we may have partially overlapping treatment strategies and potentially very complementary goals. So our work with LSVT has been based on 25 years of research funded by the National Institutes of Health, led by Dr. Lorraine Ramick, who uh, began what is now known today as LSVT. And so it's both this research and very extensive clinical experience that we've had over the years. LSVT Loud is our speech therapy, and that's delivered by LSVT Loud certified speech language pathologist, whereas LSVT Big is our physical or occupational therapy delivered by physical or occupational therapist. So within that context, we want to change that loosely connected management to be more tightly connected. And it's connected through this one common rehabilitation goal of amplitude. And that comes across in evaluation, in treatment, as well as our lifelong follow-up for our patients with Parkinson's disease. So let's take a look at two videos to sort of set the stage. One, the first video will be a woman with uh, Parkinson's disease. You'll see her immediately before and then immediately after one month of intensive treatment. And then the second video will be a gentleman uh, who received LSVT big. You'll see him walking out of the clinic uh, the first day of treatment and then the last day of treatment. So we'll just play these videos back to back and then come back and have some um, commentary. Any changes in your speech or your voice that you would associate with Parkinson's? Yes, I don't speak loud enough a lot of times. Mm. Anything else? Horse. Uh -huh. Anything else? I stutter, which I never did before. Mm. Would you say Parkinson's disease has caused you to talk less? Yes. Because? because I stutter and then I can't be heard. If there's noise in the house, like when the kids come over, nobody pays attention to it because they can't hear me until I get mad and then yell. Have you noticed changes in your speech or your voice as a result of the speech therapy? Oh, yes. What have you noticed? I talk louder. I think louder. <laughs> I'm going to sing with the Son of the Sons of the Pioneers one of these days with my, my voice. <laughs> Good for you. That's excellent. Has anyone commented that it's easier to understand you now? Oh, yes. I set some of our friends back when we went to their house and I talked loud. Lou says, what the hell happened to you? <laughs> my daughter said, oh, Ma, that's you? <laughs> what do you do when you want to be as easy to understand as possible? Think loud. So this video does not have any audio, so I'll, I'll give a little um, talk over it. You can see on the left-hand side, pretty classic Parkinson gait. Um, he's using a cane, limited arm swing. You see a little bit of uh, hesitation, freezing at that doorway entrance, small kind of shuffling steps. And then on the right-hand side, you see him after um, 16 sessions of LSVT big. And while his gait is not perfect, it's certainly much improved. He has bigger steps. He's got some better arm swing. He actually stopped using his cane. 
And, and importantly, he's able to keep it up. It's not just for five steps. Um, and then once he leaves the clinic, it goes back to how it was before. And that's uh, something that takes intensive treatment and time to make those changes that last. So as we're uh, transitioning them back to the slideshow, just a few comments on Shirley as well. After treatment, before treatment, you could hear her voice was soft, uh, monotone, a little uh, uh, hoarse voice quality. And after treatment, we see the nice improvements in terms of a louder, clearer voice. But I think what um, inspires us all as LSVT clinicians that you could, <clears throat> excuse me, certainly see with Shirley, it's her ability to express that amazing, fun, personality. And I think that's what we get with behavioral intervention is the ability to help patients um, be able to express who they are and uh, sort of get back to feeling like their old selves again. So let's take a little uh, background on motor impairment and Parkinson disease and some of the underlying pathophysiology that spans speech and motor systems. One of the key um, symptoms of Parkinson's disease is hypokinesia. It's a primary motor symptom. It's present in every person with Parkinson's. So in speech, we see that as a progressive loss of loudness. Uh, in, in fine motor, we see a progressive loss of amplitude of handwriting and other fine motor skills. In gait, we see progressive even shortening of stride length and arm swing. And we just saw a beautiful example of that in the video. We also see progressive loss of speed and amplitude in repetitive movements and progressive loss of speed and amplitude with activities of daily living. When we look at the physiology of this, starting with speech, we see that there is an underlying um, commonality. And this is looking at absolute thyroid arytenoid muscle amplitude. The orange are young individuals, the purple are aged, and the, um, I guess it would be kind of gold color, are people with Parkinson disease. And this is the activity in muscles of the, the larynx or the vocal folds. And what we see is that the activity, the muscular um, electrical activity is reduced in people with Parkinson's disease across every single speech task. Similarly, in limb movement, we can see that there's a progressive loss of ability to internally modulate muscle activation. And so in this first panel on the left-hand side, we see in controls a normal biphasic muscle activation relationship that changes in early and late Parkinson's where we have decreased duration, decreased peak amplitude, and um, increased number of bursts to achieve the same movement. So collectively, we have hypokinesia, bradykinesia underlying both speech and movement challenges in people with Parkinson's disease. When we think about how does that affect activities of daily living and mobility engagement, it's huge. We know patients have difficulty with dual tasking efficiency, balance and stability, which affects safety. The fear of falling affects everyday task involvement. Slow movements, again, affect efficiency, difficulty with initiation. Tremors and hypokinesia can affect activities of daily living, including object manipulation and potential learned non-use. And then kinesthetic awareness impairs a patient's ability sometimes to recognize changes in posture or movement or speech. While we oftentimes focus on the motor symptoms, and of course, last night we had an entire webinar on this topic. Today we have one slide, but we have to consider the impact of non-motor symptoms as well. And the three that I'll highlight today are ones that we really address directly in LSVT Loud and LSVT Big. That's loss of higher cognitive function. So we need treatment strategies that are simple and redundant as well as um, sensory changes, um, in particular, decreased kinesthetic awareness. People don't realize they're as soft as they are. They don't realize they're as small or slow as they are. And when we use amplitude to improve that, they oftentimes feel it's too loud or too big. And then the emotional changes that can affect the ability to engage in therapy. This may be apathy and anxiety.
So when we put all this together, we're, we're, we're faced again, we come back to this idea, it's very complex. And it can be overwhelming. My gosh, how can we successfully treat and efficiently treat people who have motor impairments, sensory impairments, cognitive impairments, and emotional impairments all together. And the good news is that we can, but I think um, we are kidding ourselves if any of us think it's simple or easy. And that leads us to our LSVT protocols. And I believe I'm turning the show over to Erica now to lead you through the next section. Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. And thank you, Cynthia, for leading us off. So let's talk about what the LSVT Loud and the LSVT Big protocols are and how we can work really as a team, an interprofessional team, to use these protocols to address the motor and even the non-motor issues that come along with Parkinson's disease. So the LSVT protocols are really a structured and evidence-based rehabilitative treatment protocol. And so Laura will re be reviewing some of that literature that has backed these protocols um, coming up a little later in the slideshow. And so what we are going to be doing in these protocols is really following a principle of motor learning as well as activity-dependent neuroplasticity to achieve the changes we're looking for in our patients. So the protocols really uh, encompass those neuroplasticity principles of intensive and challenging exercises that are very specific uh, and were planned for people that with Parkinson's disease and those unique features that they have. And we also, not only uh, do we apply all those things, but we really look at the individual and personalize the protocol to them. We use very specific training for voice, mobility, and activities of daily living, which we'll talk about next. So each of the protocols consists of the same uh, treatment delivery as far as uh, times per week for consecutive days for four weeks, and it's 16 sessions within one month. So LSVT Loud is four weeks and LSVT Big is four weeks. So they are separate protocols, but they follow the same pattern. They are one hour individual therapy sessions in which we uh, will show you next what that is gonna look like. And we provide some daily homework practice in addition to the therapy session with the idea that we're trying to develop these lifelong habit changes um, with continuous practice at home. So let's first talk about the LSVT Loud treatment session. So within that one hour session, the first thing that the speech therapist will instruct in is maximum duration of sustained vowels. So those are the long ahs, and there's 15 or more reps performed of those along with high and low frequency range practice, 15 reps each, and then working on functional speech sentences, and those are individually chosen by the patient, five repetitions, 10 phrases. That's followed by hierarchy exercises in which we now start to get into how do we apply those daily exercises to function? So we utilize structured reading tasks with multiple repetitions um, and then work on trying to bridge the gap to regular conversation. And hierarchy tasks are built over four weeks in complexity to challenge the patient to work toward what their goals are to improve their communication with their friends, family, loved ones. And then homework, as we mentioned, every day we assign that throughout the month uh, that is to help to carry that over to everyday life so we practice all the things that we do in the session at home to improve on that carryover then with the um, real life situations so the goal of lsvt loud is you have your treatment session your long ahs your high lows reading sentences and then at home, the goal obviously is the functional piece of it, the louder voice when you're speaking with your loved ones, when you're trying to carry on a conversation, or maybe you, you are still working and you need to be able to project your voice um, in a speaking engagement. And so the idea is that your treatment exercises carry over to that larger goal of what you want to get out of functional, get out of it functionally. 
So the idea behind that really is that it's not just exercise. It's not just the voice exercises that get you there, but it's also then carrying that over to the functional communication that the individual is looking to have improvements on. So we use things that are salient, meaning important to that person. How can we motivate them to do the exercise, to then carry that over, to actually have that improved co communication or those aha moments like, wow, my loved one didn't ask me to repeat myself. I, they were able to hear me. Um, and so that's what we call kind of that aha moment. Like our individual that we're working with in the clinic realizes that they actually can improve their communication with the therapy and the exercises and the carryover. Let's take a look at a video of an LSVT loud hierarchy progression. most people fail instead of succeed is because they give up what they want most for what they want at the moment. Excellent. That sounded great. Again, just like that. The reason most people fail instead of succeed is because they give up what they want most for what they want at the moment. Good. A leader knows what's best to do. A manager knows merely how best to do it. Excellent. You can't get rid of poverty by giving people money. Good, keep them loud. I was an anxious child to begin with, and I found this unnerving. That's the end of the page. <laughs> what? That's the end of the page. Oh my gosh, did you feel how your voice, you have this wonderful voice, and then you went, that's the end of the page. I know. I, well, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's what we don't want to have happen. I know, I know, it's so All hard. All the time. I know it is. I know it is. How did that feel reading with the loud voice? Comfortable. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Feel like more effort than you're used to? Yes. Good. Uh -huh. Good. Okay. It sounded wonderful. So what have you learned, Jennifer, about your voice in the past one month's time? What have I learned? That it's in there somewhere. Yeah. That it can be drawn out. Yeah. Without, actually, without too much effort. I mean, 16 days, yeah, but still it's doable. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, it feels so much better. Cool. And I love the response. Yeah. Too, so. Excellent. So as you can see, it requires a lot of repetitive practice and Cynthia giving excellent cues and feedback to help really pull that all together. The feedback really helps to drive the performance and to carry that over. And you can see how pleasing that is to really have that realization um, by the end of the treatment for weeks. And the progression of, of how we get to that point uh, is going to be mirrored in the LSVT big treatment protocol call as well in our hierarchy. So let's take a look at how that looks similar to LSVT loud in that we have these maximal daily exercises that we do each day in the clinic. So we have seven of them. All of the movements are listed there on the slide. And so we have rep repetitions of each of those. We have two seated exercises and five standing exercises. We follow that with functional component tasks. And what these are, are again, individualized, actually selected tasks for each person, something that's salient to them. And they're simple tasks that we perform repetitively over the time of the treatment. And so there are five reps each session, plus we practice those as well at home. And just some examples of that, sit to stand is for everyone. And then we select four additional things, um, simple tasks like pulling your keys out of your pocket, using your cell phone, and maybe tucking in your shirt, um, buttoning a cuff button, something like that for um, some quick five reps each utilizing bigness that we learn during the maximal daily exercises. We follow that with walking big practice, uh, that can vary per individual. 
And then hierarchy exercises. So again, this is complexity that is built over the four weeks of treatment. And it's a larger task, something that is done in day-to-day -day life, such as getting out of bed, maybe going shopping, doing the dishes, cooking. And we take that large task and we increase the complexity over the four weeks, utilizing amplitude and bigness throughout that task. Then we prescribe some homework with the maximal daily exercises, functional component practice, big walking, as well as these carryover assignments in which we work on generalizing use of amplitude outside of the treatment room. So the goal of LSVT Big is really to get generalization of your functional activity that that person's goal is, something that's salient to them, into real life. So just like loud, you have your treatment exercise. And then the treatment goal is what the, is important to that patient. And you try to, you're using really the exercises as like a stepping stone to get to that goal in everyday life. So we're working toward really having the protocol personalized, even though it's a protocol, we're individualizing it or personalizing it, making sure it's purposeful and salient to that patient and doing lots and lots and lots of practice. Because as you can see in the video that we watched with Loud even, that it really is difficult. We kind of fall away from it with something that maybe we haven't practiced. Maybe it's novel or maybe um, we just forget to continue to utilize the effort and the amplitude. And so what we really want to emphasize, it's not just the exercises. It's really about getting to utilizing the exercises and then getting to the functional task practice, utilizing the same effort you use throughout the exercise practice. Let's take a look at a video of an LSVT big hierarchy progression. Table over there and show me how that might go at home if you were to seat yourself at the dining room table. Okay. So it took a few scoots in to get up to the table. Yes. Okay. And then um, you're done with your meal, and then how do you get out? Okay. Walk big, and let's see if you can get even bigger with your steps. Okay. Okay, go ahead. That looks really good. How does that feel? Natural. Good. Pull it all the way back. Good, and then push it in with your big effort. Good. Why don't you use both hands now to pull it all the way back? Good. Those are big steps back, too. Out big and back big. Good. It was pretty good. How about yours? Good. What did you do today? I uh, did a lot of training today. You did? Well, yes. I made your favorite meal for supper. I can't wait. What I'm would you... starved. I bet you are from all that exercising you did today. Well, not too bad. Are you going to join me? Yes, I will. Very I'd good. love to. All well, right. I'm always talking to wait for the lady oh, to sit. Oh, such a gentleman. Good. Good. Okay, so you can see how Laura progressed uh, that individual through the treatment sessions, making it more challenging as the weeks go. And that's the whole idea is to continue to challenge the individual to incorporate amplitude throughout the entirety of the task um, and not just one portion of the task.
And so really what we want to emphasize as well is when you hear the word protocol, just want to go back to that idea again, is that yes, it is standardized because we have literature backing the effectiveness, but we individualize the functional portions of the protocol to really make it meaningful for them. And we want you to know that some individuals are lower functioning, some are high as we know, and we can make adaptations to the movements or the challenges that we make to really fit into that person's life, their goals, and make the treatment achievable for them. The end goal is calibration. So let's talk just a little bit about calibration. What we wanna teach our individuals as we're going through the protocol is really that self-monitoring where they internally cue these new bigger movements or louder voice is really the sign of success over that time. And so when the patient is able to use their louder voice and their bigger movements automatically, that's when we know we've met that goal. So let's look at how these the treatment can have that effect. So in in a pre-treatment model, what we see is when we evaluate someone, they come in typically showing that there is a reduced motor output. They don't um, produce as loud of a voice um, with their vocalization or as big of movement. And so then what we observe is that production of less vocal vocalization and smaller movements, and individuals aren't self-cueing the change for that. And so that is a sensory motor processing deficit that we that we are observing. And so because they're not changing it, they continue to move small and slow. And unfortunately, that creates kind of a cycle of continued reduced motor output and smaller and softer voice. Small, so, smaller movements and softer voice. Now in post-treatment, so as we go through the treatment, what we want to do is at the very bottom of this um, depiction here, we want to increase that motor output. We want to override the hypokinesia and bradykinesia with size, forceful, more vigor um, movements and louder voice, which then produces what we're looking for, louder voice, bigger movements. And then throughout the production of that, what we're going to see is we're going to see improvement in the self-perception of when are they loud enough, when are they big enough. And then that facilitates a continuation of improved internal cueing, improved use of amplitude, and then ideally we're increasing that motor output for the long term for that vocalization and movement because it's rewarding to them that they are able to move better and um, speak louder. So how might these parallel uh, protocols uh, work together? You know, they're, they're parallel, they look similar, um, we're both driving amplitude. So we are, if we can work with an individual together, this really can drive the system even more than say if they get these protocols separately. Um, some individuals that can be challenging, but it can be extremely beneficial to see them um, during the same month's time or very shortly um, thereafter once they've received one or the other. So we really get this whole body-wide sensory sensory motor retraining, we have the nervous system all revved up, we are improving um, their ability to be ready for those treatments. We're priming the neural system. And then obviously we can um, see some things in the literature, which Laura will review next, that amplitude can really get generalized and um, spread of effects through the motor, other motor areas while you're working on certain things in treatment. And we're looking for calibration across all motor symptoms, systems. So let's have Laura talk a little more about the literature that we have. I think this is actually kicking back to me first and then it'll go to Laura. So this is Cynthia again. And um, just want to highlight, how do we know LSVT loud and LSVT big therapies work? And that comes from our evidence. Now we have entire webinars again on evidence. So the goal is not to share all of that with you today, but just to give you um, a brief overview. So this has been a 30 plus year um, journey from when the work first began again under the leadership of Dr. Lorraine Ramick to where we are today. And so it just highlights our timeline of the studies that we've done, the randomized controlled trials for which we have three for LSVT lab. And then you see where the development of LSVT big began. And our first randomized controlled trial for LSVT big was published in 2010. The evidence for LSVT loud again is very extensive. It is the only speech treatment for Parkinson's disease with this level of evidence. 
And what we see in this slide are some graphs. I think it's coming up. There we go. Um, and these are um, charts from each of our three randomized controlled trials. I won't go through this in detail other than to highlight one we compared LSVT Lab that focuses on voice to parallel intensive programs that either focused on a respiratory target, an articulatory target, or an untreated group. LSVT Loud statistically significantly had greater improvements that also lasted over time. Next slide. And beyond just establishing efficacy for LSVT Loud, we've had numerous studies, over 30 from our laboratory alone, examining what else changes. And so the distributed effects, the neural correlates, to try to understand the mechanism of change. So hopefully that information will help us make the treatment better. And these extend things such as facial expression, articulatory acoustics, um, electromyography, swallowing, and even neuroimaging. So the, the data are rich and now I believe Laura will take over and walk us through some of the big data. Indeed and thank you Cynthia. So um, again this is a very brief overview and you can find all of our research and references on our blog. LSVT BIG thus far has two randomized control trials and a number of other um, phase one study. So we're just sharing with you our first randomized control trial, which is called the Berlin Big Study that was published in Movement Disorders in 2010. Um, this came out of Germany. And so for this study, they compared LSVT Big, which is a dosage, as you know, four times a week for four weeks to Nordic walking, also 16 sessions, but provided twice a week times eight weeks. So they got the same um, total amount of therapy just um, dosed differently over four weeks versus eight weeks. And then the third arm was um, a home exercise program control group where they were doing Parkinson's specific exercises but unsupervised and they were to do those daily as well. The main outcome variable that they looked at in this study was the UPDRS motor score and you might be familiar with that in that um, a decrease in that score signifies an improvement in motor function. From this chart, I hopefully you can see it on your screen, the dashed line on the bottom is the LSVT big group. And that group was the only group to show improvements um, over the course of treatment and beyond. You can see the endpoint of the study was actually 16 weeks. Um, the amount of change was both statistically and clinically significant, and um, the difference between groups was also significantly different. Um, the Nordic walking group and the home exercise program group did not improve at all and slightly declined. Um, you can see that there was a trend towards continued improvement for the LSVT big group. There were other things that they measured as well, such as timed up and go, that also improved in the LSVT big group. Important to note that this was a blinded rater for this study. So some of the other studies that have come out have shown um, preliminary results showing improvements in trunk rotation range of motion, stride length, speed of reaching, speed of gait, uh, cued reaction time, balance coordination ADL function, and two of our newer studies show interesting improvements in dual tasking as measured by the TUG manual and the TUG cognitive, and also occupational performance, which we think is really key in um, identifying tasks that are meaningful to each patient. So these were two OT studies that came out and i um, excited to have more occupational therapy related studies come out um, with LSBT big since it's so relevant to that discipline. The LSVT team approach is an interesting one to address. As a clinician myself, I think it's the only treatment approach where I work so closely with my colleagues who are also LSVT certified, whether they be OT, um, PT, or speech colleagues, and allows us to really work together collaboratively. But we're gonna talk about that specifically and also about IPP in general in this next section. So IPP can occur in a number of different places and in a number of different ways. 
if you work in a large hospital, for example, where you maybe have um, under one roof um, acute care, maybe rehab, inpatient rehab, outpatient as well, that care and that interprofessional practice can happen um, sometimes more easily than if you were in a um, freestanding outpatient clinic. So in other words, maybe um, a therapist starts a patient in acute care or rehab, and then they can essentially transfer their care and complete the remainder of the protocol um, under that same roof, but in a different practice setting, say outpatient rehab, for example. Um, within the facility as well, you might have really tight communications with neurologists, um, nurses, other referring physicians, and other healthcare providers within your organization. Um, there are other ways that you can network with other Parkinson's experts. Parkinson Net has a growing um, network of therapists who have been specifically trained in um, information relevant to people with Parkinson's to improve their care globally. Um, just starting in the United States, but really quite, quite common and growing in Europe. Um, allied team training, some of you might have participated in that continuing education course. It's a three-day course put on by the Parkinson's Foundation. It's really excellent and um, teaches clinicians how to work together as a team um, amongst allied health professionals and also with other uh, medical team providers as well. And so we um, really think that's a great program as well. And LSVT Global, we have our own network. Um, within this network, you might be able to bridge across healthcare sections as well in healthcare settings. And we'll talk about that later when Bernie takes over this slideshow. And individually, if you're not part of a large healthcare organization, it's okay because you can still participate in an interprofessional practice by reaching out to other known Parkinson's experts in your community, such as those that you might find in on the LSVT Global Database or um, other databases. So today we have trained well over 40,000 LSVT certified clinicians represented by a total of 75 countries around the globe. Um, it's a vast number and how do we really work together? It's a great question, both within our discipline and across disciplines. One of the best things that you can do, of course, if you're certified in LSVT, is to screen and educate um, so that people don't fall through, fall through the cracks. And um, if you work in a hospital, for example, um, you might have noticed that, gosh, you know, why was this person never referred to therapy? He already has advanced, you know, Parkinson's disease, he's broken his hip, and this is the first time that as someone has mentioned something about going to therapy. So that's the kind of thing that we want to try to prevent and improve through interprofessional practice. As an LSVT therapist, the more that you can understand about what the, your colleagues do, um, whether they're you know, um, OT or PT or speech therapist, you can really support each other and provide great education to your patients about why that treatment might be beneficial. Um, neurologists have a very limited time with patients, and so you can serve as a gatekeeper. Maybe the patient came to you for a referral for LSVT big, but you notice during that that, boy, this patient's voice is hoarse and raspy and soft. I can be a gatekeeper to educate and to help um, refer that patient to an evaluation for speech therapy and hopefully receive LSVT loud. So we can all work together in that education piece. One question that we get often is, do we do you know, OT, PT, speech, or all three of them? Um, it's, it's a great question, and I would say the answer is not the same for every single person, um, but these are, these are some good questions to ask yourself. Is one a priority? So maybe the patient comes in and is having you know, really a lot of difficulties with ADLs and toileting, and just you know, basic things like that, where OT might be really the priority in improving that patient's quality of life. Um, whereas sometimes it's communication. And so looking at a patient's individual needs and goals is uh, number one in that guiding that discussion. 
you might see that there's reimbursement considerations. I know that some people are concerned about um, the Medicare thresholds and luckily we don't have a cap anymore. Um, we have a KX modifier, but we do continue to share that same pot between PT and speech therapy. Are there scheduling concerns? So think about it just should one come you know, before the other in terms of scheduling uh, ease for both you and um, the patient? Or is it possible that they could be both seen in the same month like Erica suggested? There might be medical complexities which need to be addressed first. As therapists, sometimes a patient comes in for one evaluation and we notice that, gosh, you know, you really have this bad shoulder from this injury that you had last week when you fell. Um, let's clear up that shoulder injury first before we start LSVT big. The patient might have DBS in the future and you might need to consider the timing of when to do therapy, um, both pre and post. And there might be some significant fatigue or cognitive considerations that need some prehab, what we call first, or um, increased um, um, communication and help from the caregiver. So all of these things are unique to each individual and require communication amongst the team members. So in terms of LSVT big delivery options, it can be provided um, totally by the occupational therapy uh, therapist. And that's typically what Erica does in her practice settings. Um, the needs and goals are all related to their ADLs, their IADLs at home, work and play, we say. It can be provided totally by a physical therapist. And so that therapist would focus more on their mobility and balance issues, again, at home, work and play. So this might be a person that comes in with lots of falls and freezing issues or uh, balance related concerns. Or really commonly, uh, a lot of patients with Parkinson's disease have both needs. You know, they have difficulties with balance and mobility and ADLs. And LSVT, P LSVT Big can be delivered in a way that OT and PT are each seeing the patient two days a week, not in the same days, but on separate days, so that on those days they can work on discipline specific goals with amplitude really as the basis of the means to achieve them. So we might be working on the same exercises, but we're working on big amplitude movements so that the patient can pull up their pants, button their buttons, hand right, get out of a chair, you know, whatever it is that's specific to that discipline. And communication during handoffs is essential so that if you're the next therapist to see that patient, you know exactly what they worked on the previous day. Providing treatment support is very important. Um, so if a patient is seeing, being seen by LSVT loud, um, I can support calibration activities. So if that patient is being seen by me um, in that same month and comes down to my session, I can say, you know, was that really the loud voice that you were supposed to be working on in your speech therapy um, or could it be louder? So we can help to um, support and help, help keep that patient accountable. Likewise, the speech therapist during their sessions can say, now is that really the big posture that Laura had you working on in LSVT Big? If there's problems come up, that we can solve them as a team together. And so that really all together helps to support calibration. After therapy is done, after those one month in intensive treatments are done, we encourage our patients to come back generally every six months or so for a scheduled tune-up, much as like you would go to the dentist for a scheduled checkup on a periodic basis. During those tune-ups, we can also help to screen, hey, is that patient's voice still as loud as it was when I last saw them, or do they maybe need to get back in for a refresher of LSVT loud, or maybe they never had LSVT loud in the first place, and I can educate them on that opportunity as well. We also have community-based exercise classes that are post-discharge for patients that we can um, recommend and encourage during those tune-up visits. But whatever it is, um, communication is really the key ingredient, and how you communicate is going to be specific to your practice setting and your personal preferences. But of course, it could be by phone, in person, if they're just down the hall from you, through the EMR. Um, so up to you, but find the one that's most efficient for you. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Erica and Bernie. 
So this is my facility in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and we do do the LSVT loud with our speech therapist and then myself, the LSVT big protocol within the same month. Individuals come in for that entire month. We have two at one time. So they get one hour of loud and while I'm doing an hour of big, and then we flip flop, that person um, goes to loud and I see um, the next person for big. And then for the third hour of the program, uh, they see our recreational therapist for a two on one session to facilitate big and loud movements. And so then we also run a post-discharge uh, LSVT big and loud class. My speech therapist and myself and rec therapists run that for all of our graduates. And then we have them all come back for tune-ups as needed. This is uh, one of our other faculties facility, the Dan Aaron Parkinson Center Rehab uh, Center. And this follows another one of what Laura was talking about, options for teamwork, interprofessional practice, in that we're looking at the, the PT, LSVT Big uh, Certified PT, the LSVT Big Certified OT, uh, both evaluate the individual, uh, and then they meet with each other to determine the plan. Uh, and they split up the sessions and uh, work together on goals, which is excellent. And then the speech therapist is also involved as well. They do the um, team rounds on a monthly basis. They have frequent daily contact with each other within the gym and within their department and also run post-discharge classes and scheduled tune-ups. All right, and uh, this is Bernie, and I am going to be I'm going to be sharing a little bit about my home health networks based on my experience. I've worked in several large home health networks, and I'm currently in a continuum of care that we'll talk about. And we will touch on recent changes in Medicare reimbursement through PDPM and PDGM platforms in the later slides. But overall, these are your patients who are in the later stage; they're medically complex. Um, in a home health setting, you always begin with an OASIS. And the important thing, the thing that's been emphasized at my previous settings and my current settings, is that uh, it's important for us to establish our, ourselves as reasonable and necessary. And in current uh, reimbursement environments, it's especially important to establish that you have high complexity and acuity, which is a, really a no brainer. Most of our patients do have that. They may come to us in home health. Um, for some other type of an acute problem, let's say a hip fracture, but you may have an opportunity to treat them in the later stages of rehab then um, for Parkinson's disease uh, symptoms and issues and functional issues. And it is all about function in home health. Now, all clinical groupings do qualify. Uh, again, those of you who are familiar with PDGM know about clinical groupings. A patient does not need to be necessarily in a rehab clinical grouping or um, uh, anything as far as uh, just for therapy, they can, they can come to us in any clinical grouping. Um, the clinical coordination of care is often driven by the LSVT big and LSVT loud plans of care. In my experience, again, as a manager for home health clinicians, we're always hammering at people about, we know you talk, we know that you communicate, and you document something that's patient-centered in your documentation of clinician coordination of care. So this is a great opportunity because you have the plan of care around LSVT big and loud. There's a lot of information that can be put into communication around the patient's performance of exercises and, um, and the assessment, the reassessments, and even on the, the carryover tasks. Um, so best practice may also be something to consider, you know, now that we have a PDPM, PDGM approach, um, you, have, you have some opportunities to be able to begin your patients a little bit later in your first 30 days and be able to span into the second 30-day billing period. That may be something that would be useful for many of you. Um, often in our experience as well, the LSVT big and LSVT loud does intersect with available clinical programs that have been identified at start of care as being necessary for this patient for fall prevention, for caregiver teaching for dementia, or maybe even for self-efficacy around chronic conditions and managing their conditions to be able to be prepped for discharge. So LSVT big, LSVT loud fits in very, very well with that. 
and it's an overlap, but it's also a, a total intersection. And we also want you to consider, um, for those of you who are in a home health setting, that patient outreach calls are often a part of, of every uh, good clinical setting. There's three and six month follow-up calls to our patients to, um, to prompt them, then to set up their appointments with their physician or obtain additional orders for follow-up based on their uh, functional setting. And working in a clinical and a continuum setting may be a useful option, so we're going to be talking about that in a moment. Next slide, please. So let's take a look at working across practice settings for efficiency and to meet our patients' needs at every level of care. So when it comes to bridging LSVT big across practice settings, this relates to therapists in all practice settings. For example, a skilled nursing facility therapist may begin the LSVT big or LSVT loud, but the patient has moved into the next level of care based on a team decision or maybe even the facility decision more recently. And you may transfer the patient to another setting then to complete the protocol. Or you may be a home health therapist who's receiving a patient who initiated the protocol and the treatment plan for a big or loud inpatient, perhaps in a SNF, or in a subacute rehab, but you're now receiving the patient who requires the home health skill uh, intermittently. So it's possible with current reimbursement structures that there may be yet another transition in care to an outpatient LSVT big or LSVT loud certified clinician. Things are moving much more quickly uh, in, in the rehab realm as far as transitions of care. But regardless of the transition time point, your best practice is always a phone call and a precise descriptive discharge summary with a sharing of patient materials that might be related to the hierarchy task focus. It would focus on the details of the patient's exercise performance, on their progress, their progress toward goals, any special notes that you might have about environmental or cognitive challenges, and of course, their last carryover assignment. Next slide, please. So I wanna share with you an example from my own day-to-day, -day, even with today's workflow, we are, many of us are still working from home. Uh, I'm currently a, an administrator for Diamond Home Healthcare. We are a um, part of Diamond Group Healthcare, which, is, which includes a skilled nursing facility component. Uh, we have therapists who are um, contracted out to facilities. We have about 25, 26 across Michigan. And uh, we also have a small home health care, uh, and we have several outpatient settings as well, including private duty. So there is a built-in transition here already, as you can see. Um, there is some opportunities here for working with any restrictions um, that we might see with moving uh, into different reimbursement structures. And LSVT big and LSVT loud frequently can begin in the SNF and they're moved to home health and into outpatient as well. So the Diamond Healthcare Group does have that continuum of care and they, they label it as bridge to home. Uh, and the opportunities here are in addition to just the partnership of the facilities, we actually have clinicians who will move across settings. So a clinician who works with a patient using LSVT big or LSVT loud protocol inpatient will move with the patient to either an outpatient or a home health setting. And we have found that this is a real practical approach in this bridge to home. Now this doesn't always work. There are always requirements where we might need to have a health system partnership or, or a partnership in some grassroots way with some outside um, providers. And so we'll talk about that in a moment as well. But the focus might be here on continuity. When you do have the opportunities to provide that continuous health system, you have the opportunity to do some additional tracking. Now we already have a standard package of standardized measures that we recommend that you use across settings. And I would, I would also propose you might consider doing something that's a little bit more community oriented. There is something called a promise survey platform, and I'm not sure many of you have heard of that, but we've just begun using it, and it equals, it means patient reported outcome management information system. So our team at Diamond is focusing on community reintegration, standardized questionnaires across all settings, and we do this at 30 days post discharge as well. The focus that we're using is uh, community reintegration, but there are several others that you can look at. So there's many other options out there to assist you in tracking your results and your outcomes as well. I just want to encourage you. Next slide, please. 
So the previous two examples did show how a team in the same system or facility can work together, but it's true that many times patients receive speech, PT, and OT in organizations that are not affiliated with each other, and even we have that situation at times. Furthermore, as our patients' needs change, the practice setting in which they are can also um, change. So our large network of certified clinicians can provide a solution to both of these situations. For example, providers who do not work for the same healthcare organization, they can still find each other and they can communicate with each other in ways that benefit the patient. And then secondly, as the patient is progressing, they may be able to start the four-week program in one setting and finish it in the next setting, as Laura was discussing. So we've provided some resources here for you to use in locating and meeting with those kindred spirits out there, all dedicated to the best practice care of people with Parkinson's disease. Next slide, please. So let's not forget the inclusion of our physician, our MDs, our nurse practitioners, our physician's assistants as part of our collaborative approach. So tight relationships with our medical team is about more than just obtaining the referrals and signing orders. When we educate our referring uh, providers and we show them the potential of their patients through the evidence-based therapy, the behaviors of the referring providers does begin to shift. And we can see that they begin to refer to therapy sooner after diagnosis, which is a clinically sound and best approach to caring for chronic diseases, for all chronic diseases. We also see that they become true partners in our team by giving sharpened and specific recommendations, such as requesting LSVT big or LSVT loud, rather than making blanket generic referrals. They're entrusting their therapists with training and, and teaching their patients and their personal team for fitness and exercise plans. And we see that the physician and the team fully understand our treatment approaches the more that we communicate with them. In my previous work setting for a large home health agency, we were fully integrated with our movement disorder specialists, neurologists, and even family practitioners who were often on the front line for referrals to home health for LSVT big and loud. So don't be afraid to reach back to them and provide them with information about their patients. Um, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. Because we know it's a two-way conversation. Next slide, please. The two-way conversation that we're opening up. Our MDs are getting tons of information about their patients from us now. Information that they would never get through their intermittent office visits. And we have opportunities to build, to, to kind of build in those tune-up schedules the more that we request them and, and requesting new prescriptions for them. Our physicians can also really reinforce exercise adherence and can help us tremendously in holding our patients accountable and continuing the education process. How many of us know how you know, our patients really, they have a wonderful relationship with their physicians, they really care about what they think, and the more that we communicate with them about what we're doing as, as a team, and the physician looped in as a team, the more that communication is gonna come back to the patient and the patient will become a lot more compliant and a part of this engaged in the whole process. So I had a situation where I was meeting with a physician in his office, this is just one example. And it was a very unusual example, but it's interesting. And I was showing him a video of his very, very advanced patient getting out of bed big and surely had very, very uh, significant limitations. He was floored and he called in the rest of his team to view the video. And amazingly, the patient was actually in the waiting room waiting to see this doctor. And so everyone rushed out to congratulate my patient Shirley on her gains. And it, it, was, it was wonderful because we were able to further reinforce our team's efforts, not only with her, but then with her family as well. Next slide, please. So when we talk about inclusion of our allied health team and our interprofessional team, this refers to all sorts of providers, such as nurses and social workers and respiratory therapists and CNAs and dietary aides in facilities and in our physician offices. Their role in facilitating early initiation of care is truly key. And it requires us to educate them about uh, LSVT big and LSVT loud as treatment techniques and not just compensatory techniques and that exercise doesn't replace therapy. A lot of people believe simply exercise is enough and it is not. So we have opportunities to educate our allied health team in how to properly screen for therapy need and how to get the ball rolling for referrals and how to find certified clinicians as well. Once there's that baseline understanding of the value, then teaching our allied health team partners to tap into the LSVT Global website resources will be useful and to other resources. Additionally, our allied health 
teams are valuable, also valuable in reinforcing moving big and talking loud with simple cues when they're in any caregiver role or even in casual contact. So it, it can pay off for sure. Next slide, please. And finally, we must include the community as members of the interprofessional team when providing LSVT. In this situation, fitness professionals are becoming more and more common in our communities. Diamond Group Health actually incorporates college students. We have a program called Resilience for our long-term care patients who will need additional cues and structure. So this is one example of a facility-based collaboration with fitness providers. We have opportunities to teach our fitness providers about how to screen for therapy, how to uh, set up tune-ups, and how patients can incorporate big or loud approaches into their fitness routines. We also teach our fitness professionals about Parkinson's disease-specific issues and what to consider in screening for therapy. For example, things like medication adherence or side effects and medical issues as well. In short, it truly does take a village. And we do hope that some of the examples that we provided are going to prompt some initiative and innovative approaches and start the pot. So in summary, it takes a well-coordinated team to best support the needs of people with Parkinson's disease beginning a diagnosis. Targeting amplitude as a single focus in Parkinson's disease among the therapy team makes sense from both a clinical and psychological, physiological perspective. And we know that LSVT big, LSVT loud are examples of evidence-based therapy programs that will enable therapists to treat their patients' needs across the disease span comprehensively and collaboratively and efficiently. And we do know that other team members are integral in the support of patients receiving LSVT loud and LSVT big at all stages in their journey. We just wanted to finish up with a slide that highlights Jim, one of our, one of our former patients. And Jim tells us that more than a year later, I still continue my LSVT big and LSVT loud exercises almost daily. I have the confidence in my body to continue doing the things I love gardening, walking with my wife, spending time with my family, traveling, and reading poetry on the radio. Parkinson's is my enemy, but thanks to the LSVT programs, I will prevail. Thank you all. All right, thank you, Gertie. And so at this time, um, you have a couple of options. If you want to stay on and listen to the answers to the questions that have come in, you're welcome to do so. If you need to jump off and get back to your busy day, um, that is just fine too. And just a reminder that uh, we'll have two more webinars tomorrow that are listed here and you can find them on our blog under events and under free public webinars. If you want a certificate, please email webinars at lsvtglobal.com and we'll email you a certificate within the next um, few days. And just um, as a note, there's no cost for that. Um, this is a free complimentary service to you. So now um, just a review of how to ask questions. You can type in questions in your control panel, you can raise your hand or you can email us later for um, additional answer. Um, at info at lsvtglobal.com. So with that, I'm gonna open up to some questions and thank you all for questions that you have already submitted throughout the webinar. We'll get as many um, answered as we can over the next 10 minutes or so. Um, okay, so there is one question. What is the evidence for using LSVT big for individuals without Parkinson's, but with similar gait disturbance or other motor disorders from other some other neurological cause? And I'll go ahead and, and answer that one. It's a great question, and we're excited to tell you that um, we're just starting to see some emerging published, published literature in the area of chronic stroke. So there were two studies that came out one in 2018 and one in 2019. And these were both OT specific interventions utilizing LSVT big to address the needs and goals of um, some individuals in these case studies and case series that had stroke. You can find those references on our blog or you can email us at lsvtglobal.com. But in briefly, um, both, you know, all of the, the examples of the subjects in those case studies showed improvements in 
um, personal goals related primarily to upper extremity function. Um, we have yet to look at studies that are looking at gait disturbance, but it's a great area for future research. All right, um, just, um, let's see. Okay, Cynthia, maybe you could take this question. Um, when is the big and loud combination therapy going to be released for therapists to provide? Um, also, who do you plan on having deliver this combination treatment? Thank you. So I believe what you're referring to was what we have done a trial with a small trial called LSVT hybrid. Um, and when we initially did that work, it was at a time uh, when LSVT big was very new and we simply did not have the data uh, database of LSVT big therapists to work with LSVT lab therapists. At this point, the, it, it's still sort of a, a conceptual, you know, something that we've, we've done a, as I said, a small pilot on. We are still looking at how that would integrate. A lot of it is based on logistics, and I think that's what your question is referring to. How do you imagine this happening? Um, and most likely, it would be selected um, centers where we know that there's a corpus within the same center of LSVT Loud, LSVT Big, Speech, PT, OT therapists. And then it would be a training for those therapists to really um, figure out how we would or, or, uh, apply the combined therapy. Um, it would also be further figuring out who are the best candidates, which will likely be our early um, individuals with Parkinson's disease with um, less motor impairment. So I say it's a, it's a ways away um, yet, but it is something that we are still pursuing and considering and hope to be able to offer should it be actually valuable to therapists in the future. All right, thank you, Cynthia. Um, I'll take this next question. It's really simple. <laughs> How much time can a patient plan to spend on homework exercises a day outside of the clinic? Um, it's a great question. And we say in general, 15 to 20 minutes on their daily exercises um, during the month of treatment on the off days of treatment. Um, so they're seen in the clinic four days a week or by the therapist four days a week. And then the um, other three sessions are homework on their own. It might take a bit longer because they have um, two homework practice sessions they'll do for a day, per day, but lifelong 15, 20 minutes per day. And then we really train them on how to integrate their bigger movements and function um, that they're using throughout the day. Um, next question is, is there a webinar by Bernie on home health that's updated based on the new regulations? Um, and so if you are a certified clinician, I apologize that I don't know that right off the top of my head, you can look in your clinician account. There's a webinar that we did about, well, I think a month ago that included some of this updated information. You can also email us at info at lsvtglobal.com if you're an LSVT big certified clinician. And we have some um, specific information related to home health delivery and PDGM changes as well. Uh, let me see if there's any more questions here. Oh, how long is each certification good for? Is there a renewal course? Yes, so every two years we have something called an LSVT certification renewal course. There's one for LSVT Loud, there's one for LSVT Big. It's a short online course. Um, our current course is about two hours long. It's uh, $50 and it will update you on all the new research, review core principles, and give you continued access to everything in your clinician account and also um, keep you listed on the clinician directory. But it's not re um, there's no requirement to retake the full course every two years. Okay, so that is all of our typed in questions for the moment. And thank you also for your positive comments. And now before we end, I'm just going to go to the people who have raised their hands. And so give me a moment. I will call out your name so that you know that um, it's your turn to ask a question. And I believe, hold on a second. I just had you. Here we go. Um, Leslie Jackson, I'm going to unmute your microphone. And do you have a question? Just give me a second. 
Okay, your microphone is unmuted. And Leslie, do you have? Uh, I actually had submitted my question via the online chat, and so my question okay. was already addressed. Thank you. Okay. okay, thanks. I'll move on to the next person. And I believe there's one more, if you just give me a moment. Um, Prashi Rathi, do you have a question? Um, your microphone is muted by yourself. You'll have to unmute it on your own computer if you want to ask us a question. I'll just give you a moment to do so. Okay, and maybe you have typed in your question out. Yes, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Um, actually, my one of my questions was already answered by some, you know, somebody else who had asked the question. So thank you so much. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Okay, so with that, I believe that we've answered all the questions. And again, we just thank you so much for joining us with this webinar. And you'll all be entered into the drawing to win a free online LSVT big training and certification course and other prizes. Remember that there's a survey that will pop up at the end of this webinar. And please also feel free to reach us at any time. We're so glad to join you. And uh, we're so glad that you joined us as well. Good day.